the impact of Voskhod 2 and the first spacewalk by Alexei Leonov was uh, pretty major in the West. And you can see here the uh, story on the front page of the New York Times. Uh, and interesting that part of that headline says, Moscow says moon trip is target now. What's interesting about that is that it wasn't until 1964 that the Soviets really got serious about um, competing with us in the moon race. Um, for whatever reason, whether they uh, doubted Kennedy's uh, determination uh, or the United States' determination, of course, uh, by 1964, Kennedy had been assassinated and the moon program had become a, a kind of a memorial to the slain president. Uh, and that was something that, in fact, helped keep Apollo going at times when politically it seemed to be on shaky ground. But, um, you know, for, uh, for the, those of us in the public and everybody watching this incredible space spectacular of a spacewalk, um, you know, it seemed like uh, the Soviets were, you know, quite determined to reach the moon before us. And so, um, you know, this was another space spectacular, and um, it seemed as though the Soviets were just going to keep going like this, and that every time we turned around, they'd be beating us at our own game. Now, a few days after Voskhod 2, we finally got off the ground with the first manned Gemini flight, March 23, 1965. There you see uh, the crew on the left. Mercury veteran uh, Gus Grissom was the commander, and the co-pilot was a rookie from the second astronaut group named John Young. And you can see on the right there the Gemini Titan lifting off. Uh, Gemini 3 was a, um, a three-orbit flight, a bit over five hours in, in duration, and went perfectly. Um, Grissom uh, used the, uh, the Gemini's thrusters to change slightly the shape and orientation of their orbit and just as a first step of demonstrating the Gemini's uh, capability to maneuver uh, above and beyond what Mercury had done. And by the way, above and beyond what Vostok and Voskhod could do, um, we didn't know for sure, but the Soviets could not match that capability. Gemini was in fact a significantly more advanced spacecraft. It even had an onboard computer. First time that a digital computer was incorporated into a manned spacecraft. Well, with Gemini off and running, now thoughts turn to the next Gemini flight, which was Gemini 4. And the primary objective of Gemini 4 had been to fly a long duration mission. And at that time, in 1965, Long duration meant something like a few days. Of course, the Vostok cosmonauts had already logged several days in orbit, but we hadn't. And uh, we were not getting access to the medical data from those uh, Soviet flights, of course. Uh, everything about those flights was kept under you know, wraps by the, the Soviet government. And in fact, we didn't even hear about them until after they had successfully launched, unlike our program, which was conducted on live television. But anyway, we needed to find out how astronauts would do on a four-day flight. Um, they were taking very methodical steps towards eventually reaching that lunar duration. But then, after Leona's spacewalk, a new objective was added to Gemini 4's flight plan, and that was a spacewalk by uh, the co-pilot, <clears throat> Ed White, and uh, NASA was so determined to catch up with the Soviets that they added the extravehicular activity, as it was called, or EVA, to the flight plan for Gemini 4. <clears throat> now, the, the gear for this spacewalk had to be developed in Houston in a kind of a secret effort. They kept it under wraps. They didn't know if it would be ready in time for the Gemini 4 mission, and they didn't want to risk 
announcing that this would happen and then having to back off and being seen as a failure. So they kept it secret uh, until it was actually ready. The gear consisted, of course, of a special spacesuit that could have that had extra layers of insulation from the extreme temperatures, hot and cold, of the vacuum of space. Um, there was an umbilical line to carry uh, breathing oxygen and communications to the spacewalking astronaut. There was an emergency oxygen supply, which was kept in a chest pack. You can see on the lower left there that sort of rectangular, that horizontal rectangular box that's attached to the astronaut's chest. And then one of the really cool things was, or the, the coolest thing, was this nitrogen-powered maneuvering gun that you see at the upper left. And it had a uh, kind of a trigger. You could hold on to that black part and squeeze the uh, bar, and uh, you would release uh, a blast of uh, compressed nitrogen from those two metal bottles. They would come out the two nozzles at the end of that long, skinny arm. And uh, with that, the astronaut could propel himself where he chose, as long as the uh, nitrogen supply uh, in those two little bottles held out. And there was even a, a camera attached to the gun so the astronaut could take pictures while he was walking in space. On the right there, you see Ed White practicing with this gun on a special uh, uh, machine that looks like a big uh, vacuum cleaner, but it's in fact a, uh, an air flotation device that puts out a cushion of air that slides along a very smooth, polished floor. And this was how Ed White practiced getting the hang of uh, moving around from one place to another in, in sort of weightlessness, at least in two dimensions you're, you're moving with a frictionless surface. Now let's take a look at what that actually looked like on June 3rd, 1965. There's Ed White standing in the open hatch of the Gemini 4. He's wearing his uh, special uh, spacesuit. Of course, Jig McDivitt has his spacesuit on too, closed up, and he's in the vacuum of space as well. Here's White leaving the cabin with the maneuvering gun propelling him away from the spacecraft. And uh, they're, everybody's moving at 17,500 miles an hour. But of course, what matters here is the relative motion. And uh, of course, that motion is rather stately and uh, not at all overdone as White maneuvers with the gun. The nitrogen ran out pretty quickly, and uh, White was uh, left with only... Uh, pulling on the tether and pushing against the spacecraft as a way of changing his position and orientation. You see him here kicking against the nose of the spacecraft. Notice his face is hidden behind a mirrored sun visor. And uh, these movie films and the still pictures taken by the commander, Jim McDivitt, were some of the most spectacular photographs in the history of the space program, and they certainly had an impact on a lot of young people, including myself, I think that was the moment at which I realized that nothing else would do unless I could be an astronaut. Well, with that success under their belt, NASA moved on to doubling the duration of the next Gemini flight, Gemini 5, which lasted uh, from August 21st to August 29th in 1965, an eight-day mission. Commander was Mercury veteran uh, Gordo Cooper, the co-pilot was rookie Pete Conrad, and uh, it's the first time that uh, fuel cells were used on the uh, Gemini, first time that fuel cells were ever used in space, and that was because the um, flight was uh, too long for the Gemini's batteries to have powered the spacecraft. The four-day flight was about the limit there, and uh, they had their share of problems. The fuel cells uh, acted up other problems that uh, they had to get through. The ground control was uh, very uh, in instrumental in uh, solving those problems and helping them to keep going. They, uh, they landed on the 29th of August and there they are in the right hand photo on the deck of the carrier looking happy um, and uh, bearded and uh, kind of grungy and uh, in fact Pete Conrad referred to the flight as eight days in a garbage can because you and your buddy are in this little cabin that's no bigger than the front seat of a Volkswagen Bug, 
and uh, let's say that with uh, bathroom facilities that consisted of nothing more than hoses and bags, it could get kind of grungy and weightlessness with everything floating around if it wasn't contained. And I'll leave the rest to your imagination, but uh, you can see the uh, crew patch, eight days or bust, the pioneer covered wagon. They really did feel like pioneers. And uh, they kept the uh, eight days or bust covered up because NASA didn't want anybody to see that in case they didn't make it the full eight days, but they did make it. And this was a big step forward uh, in accomplishing Gemini's objectives.